Okay, hello everyone and welcome to another uh, Science of Spirituality study with the Matsari.com website. And so um, tonight's study is titled How Genetic Variation Gives Rise to Differences in Mathematical Abil Ability. And then try and draw out a spiritual insight. Now, recent a recent publication reports on a gene you know, called Robo-1, which is associated with early anatomical differences in a brain region that has a role in our understanding of numbers and math and potentially explaining how genetic variability shapes the aptitude of children in mathematics. You know, researchers in this study used test scores from second grader, graders in math to study the genetic variations of the Robo-1 gene and how this is associated with the part of the brain that promotes increased mathematical ability in case. So the study was published in the PLOS Bio. Uh, that might be a shortened version of the journal. But um, I'm not sure what journal that is, but uh, we could, we could Google it real quick. But the title of it was uh, Neurobiological Origins of Individual Differences in Mathematical Ability. And it was published in 2020. It was just recent. So I got a link there. You can go to it. You can check it out and see what they have to say directly from the, from the researchers. But um, the mathematical ability is a known inheritable thing and is related to several genes that play a role for brain development. It is also known that genetic variability can lead to differences in mathematical ability. And to address this gap in understanding, researchers combined genotype with brain imaging imaging in unschooled children without mathematical training. And the researchers analyzed eight single nucleotide polymorphisms the SNPS genetic variants affecting a single DNA building block in 10 genes previously thought to be related to mathematical performance. Then they used the brain imaging technique, the MRI, right, magnetic resonance imaging, to study the relationship between variations in the gene and the volume of the nerve cell bodies in the brain. And so the sample population was 178 children, ages ranging from three to six years old. They identified regions in the brain whose nerve cell volume could predict math test scores in second grade. And the researchers found variations in the Robo-1 gene that regulates prenatal natal growth of the outer layer of the neural tissue in the brain for mathematical ability. Now, the volume of nerve cells along with gene variation led to the ability to predict the children's ability to perform well on math tests, even to seven and nine years of age. And this research shows how genetic variability can shape mathematical ability by influencing early development of the brain's basic mathematical processing system. Okay, so that, that was what the paper and the researchers had talked about. And I know that um, I had mentioned earlier that mathematic ability is a known inheritable, inheritable thing. You know, I can see it in my own son. I remember in last year when he was in kindergarten and he was, they, they give them so many words to, to memorize and so you can just start reading. And he struggled with that. And when we saw his report card, you could, you could see we were struggling with that. And, um, but when we, I looked at the math, he was A, 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 A all the way through. And it's like he didn't struggle with mathematics at all. And he, even now he, he loves math and playing with numbers. You know, he does, does it on his little whiteboard we got upstairs. But um, it, it definitely is inheritable. You know, I'm, good, I'm good at math. I never had trouble with math. You know, I always um, excelled at it in school, you know, and I didn't have to study hard, very hard at all. And um, I just, it just clicked. It's just one of those things. And it, it, uh, according to the research, it says that this is a, this is a genetic variable you know, that, that is inheritable. Okay? And so um, I thought it was really, really neat study, I thought. And so the spiritual insight that we receive from this type of research is related to this genetic inheritance of mathematical ability. You know, this type of research draws out questions of whether one needs to be, I, I thought, of whether one needs to be intelligent in order to understand God's word. You know, the approach for studying God's word, the Bible, understanding the natural world, and living our lives for the Lord God of Israel rests upon this very important question. You know, does, does one need to be intelligent in order to understand what the Lord God is looking for in our lives? 
You know, this is related to whether we should use man's wisdom or versus God's wisdom. You know, in the scientific community, man's wisdom supersedes God's wisdom. You know, we can see this also in the Christian community on questions of the science of origins, you know, who disregard the historical narrative of the creation account. You know, there appears to be a broad disregard for God's wisdom, you know, we find in the scriptures, which has resulted in becoming more difficult to help our brothers and sisters in the Messiah and the world to understand that it was in wisdom that God had made all things. You know, and we read that in Psalm 101, 104, verse 24. Now, the understanding that God is our creator, you know, we read in Genesis chapter 1 and 2, is the basis for understanding why the scriptures in the Bible has answers to life. You know, as a follower, faithful followers of God's word and of Yeshua, our lives, our faith, and our understanding of the world around us is based upon the authority of God's word. You know, the Bible touches every aspect of our lives from in morals and ethics, which dominates how we walk before God. You know, we are, we are also told in John 14 how it is by faith in Yeshua and, this, and the Spirit's leading that we are able to discern the differences between the wisdom of man and the wisdom of God. You know, as we study the Bible, it is interesting to discover that the Apostle Paul also considered this issue of wisdom when speaking to the first century Gentiles, you know, believers. You know, as, as we study the letters of Paul, we can see how the first century believers also had problems with discerning the truth and understanding the differences between man's wisdom and God's wisdom. When we read Paul's letter to the Corinthians, we learn how the people of Corinth also desired man's wisdom as opposed to God's wisdom. You know, similar to the scientific community today. You know, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 to 16, Paul speaks to the Greek community of the difficulty of understanding his message of Yeshua when adopting a perspective that is founded upon man's wisdom. You know, this becomes apparent because the Greek culture highly honored the one who had the ability to speak well and have effective use of language. You know, and his rhetoric was his rhetoric well, right? And in those days, men would stand on the street corners speaking to the people, and the people would, would gather around just to hear well-orated speeches. That's all they would do. And then we're, we're always trying to hear or understand, they were always trying to hear or understand a new thing. And the listeners would give money to the person who gave the best speech. And so the, the Greek culture was mostly concerned with the exchange of new ideas and concepts centered upon the philosophical meaning of life. And so the contrast between men's wisdom as opposed to God's wisdom was illustrated by what Paul says to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 2, verses 1 to 16. Let me read through that. He says, and when I came to you, brethren, I did not come with superiority of speech or of wisdom, proclaiming to you the testimony of God, for I determined to know nothing except you, uh, and nothing, I, I, hold on, let me read that, for I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in the demonstration of the spirit and of power. Okay, so we can see right here, Paul is, is specifically addressing the Greek culture, right? And then it says, so that your faith, you know, okay, so he just said that he came with not persuasive words, but with wisdom and a demonstration of the spirit and of power. Okay, and then he says, so that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the wisdom um, where I lost my spot? <laughs> uh, okay, let me read this again. Okay, so that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. That's what it is. I was looking for wisdom a second time. And okay, but the power of God. Yet, because I talk about in the article, wisdom of men, wisdom of, of God. Okay, um, okay, yet... We do speak wisdom among those who are mature, a wisdom, however, not of this age, nor of the rulers of this age nor who are passing away. But we speak God's wisdom and a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God predestined before the ages to our glory, the wisdom which none of the rulers of this age has understood. For, they had under, for if they had understood it, 
they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But just as it is written, things which eye has not seen and ears not heard and which have not entered the heart of man, all that God has prepared for those who love him. For to us God revealed them through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the Spirit of the man which is in him? Even so the thoughts of God no one knows except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, so that we may know the things freely given to us by God, which things we also speak not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the Spirit, combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. But a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them, because they are spiritually appraised. But he who is spiritual appraises all things, yet he himself is appraised by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord, that he will instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. Okay, so that, that was Paul. Uh, was it 1 Corinthians? Let me look at that again. Um, yeah, 1 Corinthians 2, chapter 2, verses 1 to 16. So Paul stated that he did not come with a superior way of thinking or of speaking or with the wisdom of man when he brought the testimony of God to the Corinthians. You know, he brought the teaching of, the, of Yeshua the Messiah in weakness, fear, and trembling. Right? And he said he demonstration of the spirit and in the power of God, you know, not using enticing words. And furthermore, Paul wrote that we who are in Christ have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit of a spirit who is from God, that we may know the things that have been freely given to us by God. You know, 1 Corinthians 2.12. And it is a spirit of God that helps us to know and understand, understand the things of God. And so when we step back and we look at the scriptures as a whole we see the good news of the message of a loving God who is merciful and forgiving and how he sent his son Yeshua so that we could have forgiveness for sin. And the forgiveness of sin draws in this message on the consequences of disobedience. And Paul wrote about the hopelessness of sin before God when we must underst- where we must understand that the wages of sin is death, as Paul wrote in Romans 6.23. It's difficult to understand the foundational this foundational concept, you know, the wages of sin is death, you know, while using the wisdom of man. And when looking at the world around us, and it's imperative that we base our thinking about it on the scriptures, since it is our ultimate authority and in the infallible source of God's revealed wisdom. Now, through observation and experimentation, you know, we've been able to understand the way in which the world functions, you know, via the scientific principles, you know, the chemistry, um, physics, math, and biology, right? And similar to the way in which we study the world, it's also possible to observe how the God of Israel works according to his word. You know, the ability to observe, to know, or to understand, and to experience God working in this world is by the way he works in and through us in our lives. And this is enabled by the indwelling of God's Holy Spirit. And this is what Paul thought when he said in 1 Corinthians 2.14 that by the nat- but the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. You know, when studying science from both a professional and a recreational aspect like what I do, while using the Bible as a starting starting point, there are many processes that we can observe and use to give a reasoned evidence for the handiwork of God in his creation. And the, the word gospel, habasara, means good news, which is the message of forgiveness for sin through the sacrifice of Yeshua that's made on our behalf. And this is the plan of redemption that is illustrated in the life of Moshe in delivering Israel from bondage, bringing him before the Lord at the mountain of Sinai, making a covenant with him. You know, the gospel is a message of redemption for those who will trust in the Messiah of God in order to be reconciled to a just and holy God. You know, the essential content of this message is laid out in the Torah and throughout all of Scripture, and ultimately revealed to us in the New Testament. And in Paul's letter to the Corinthians, he lays out the content of the gospel message in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 to 4. He says that, Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved, if you hold firmly to the word that I preached to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins 
according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. Okay, so the current scientific research on this, um, this new study on the Robo-1 gene uh, has been shown to regulate the volume of gray matter, the, the volume of, the, of the, the nerve cell bodies in the brain in the region that scientists believe is responsible for mathematical ability. You know, this type of research draws out these questions of whether one needs to be intelligent in order to understand the message of God's Word. You know, and the, the scriptures are written at a fifth grade level. I've, I've read that somewhere. And so reading the scriptures should not be the challenge. It really shouldn't be. The essential element of understanding the message of God wants us to hear is a matter of faith. You know, the, the message God is speaking to us is related to atonement for sin and forgiveness and mercy, right? And the Lord sent his son, Yeshua, to die for our sins. And, and this is a very important concept. Romans 3, verse 23, it states that for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And the reality of sin needs to be acknowledged by all who approach the God of Israel, seeking forgiveness and salvation. We also read elsewhere, Paul saying in 1 Timothy 4, 1, it says, now the Spirit expressly states that in the latter times, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and the doctrines of demons. Right? Now, that's a heavy statement. You know, the important aspect of this statement is that in the latter days, there are going to be some who will depart from the faith as a result of coming into contact with demonic influence. You know, if it's a doctrine of demons, there's some kind of demonic influence here, right? And notice how demons are said to be ones who are working to lead people away from their faith in Yeshua and from the God of Israel. And when we consider intelligence in relation to the wisdom of man and the wisdom of God, the wisdom of God is his word. And the wisdom of man is the vain philosophy and, and quite possibly the working of the evil one in one's life. You know, this is like Paul was trying to say in First, First Timothy 4.1. You know, the human mind is very complex, very complex. And we may not even realize what is influencing us and drawing us away from the Lord until it's too late. You know, so that's why we are warned to seek the Lord God Almighty and his, his Messiah Yeshua and to, to study his word, right, and to be in his word daily. You know, so that, that we, we are not deceived. Okay, so that, that was a study for, that I had for tonight. And if you enjoyed the study, give me a thumbs up on the channel. If you want to talk about it, send me an email. You can find it at the Matsada.com website, okay? And thanks for listening. Bye.